this is C Siren ASMR. I'm Janine, and today we're going to be reading from Red Riding Hood. Good Girls Don't Talk to Werewolves, and Red Riding Hood is by Blakely Cartwright Johnson. We're going to be reading chapter two. Chapter two. Valerie sat at the edge of the road with her legs outstretched, the ground damp in the early morning dew. She didn't worry about her feet getting run over. She never worried about things like that. She was older now. Ten years had passed since that awful night when she looked into the eyes of evil. Walking past that sacrificial altar today, though, Valerie hadn't even noticed the pile of bones left over from the previous night's offering. Like all other children in the village, she'd, she'd seen it once a month all her life, and she stopped thinking about what it meant. Most children became obsessed with the full moon nights at some point in their lives, stopping at the altar the following morning to examine the dried blood, asking questions. Does the wolf talk? Is it like the other wolves in the forest? Why is the wolf so bad? The answers they were all given were more frustrating than none at all. Parents tried to protect the children, shushing them, telling them not to talk about it. But sometimes they let slip some information saying, we put a sacrifice here so that the wolf doesn't come and eat up cute little girls like you while nipping at their noses. Ever since her encounter with the wolf, Valerie had stopped asking about it. Often at night, though, she would become overwhelmed by the memory. She would wake up and watch Lucy, an easy sleeper, having lying too much still on their shared bed, feeling desperately alone. Valerie would gaze at her sister for a long time until the panic became too much. She would reach up to feel Lucy's heartbeat. Stop it, Lucy would slur sleepily, reaching up and swatting Valerie's hand. Valerie knew that her sister didn't like to think of her heartbeat. It reminded her that she was alive, that she was fallible, just flesh and bones. Now Valerie ran her fingers over the chilled ground of the walkway, feeling the grooves between the hunks of old sandstone. The stone felt like it might collapse, like it was rotting from the inside, and with just a little more time, she would be able to crumble off bits with her fingers. The leaves of the trees were yellow, as though they had absorbed all the spring sunshine they were saving it for winter. It was easier to shrug off last night's full moon on a day like today, this whole village was in a commotion. Everyone prepared for the harvest. Men ran with rusty skids. Women leaned out of their cottage windows, dropping loaves of bread into passing baskets. Soon Valerie saw Lucy's broad, beautiful face as her sister came up the walk on the back, on the way back from taking a broken latch to the blacksmith for repair. As Lucy came up the path, some of the villagers' young daughters trailed behind her doing a strange ritualistic walk. As they came closer, Valerie realized that Lucy was teaching the four girls how to curtsy. Lucy was soft in a way that no one was, a softness of nature and being. Her hair was not red or blonde, it was both. She did not belong here in Daggerhorn. She belonged in a cottony land where the skies were marbled yellow, blue, pink, like watercolors. She spoke in poetry, her voice sweet like a song. Valerie felt as though her family was just borrowing Lucy. 
how strange it is to have a sister about, Valerie thought. Someone you might have been. Lucy stopped in front of Valerie, and the train of girls stopped too. A small one with a dirt-stained knees looked at Valerie judgmentally, disappointing in her for not being more like her older sister. The village had always thought of Valerie as the other one. The more mysterious sister, the not Lucy. Two of the girls studied a man across the road who was frantically trying to joke, yoke his ox onto the wagon. Hi! Lucy twirled the fourth young girl around, bending down to hold the girl's small head hand above her head. The girl was hesitant to make the turn to look away from her idol. The other girls looked impatient, feeling as if they, too, should be included. Valerie scratched her head, peeling at a scab. Lucy said to her sister's hand, It'll scar. Lucy's legs were unblemished, flawless. She moisturized them with a concoction of wheat flour and oil when there was extra to be had. Examining her own legs, bug-bitten, bruised, and picked at, Valerie asked, Have you heard anything about the camp out? Lucy leaned in. Everyone else has permission, she whispered. Now we have to go. Well, now it comes down to convincing mother. You try. Are you mad? She'll never say yes to me. You're the one who always gets whatever you want. Maybe. Lucy's lips were big and pink. When she was nervous, she chewed them pinker. Maybe you're right, she said, grinning. In any case, I'm a step ahead of you. With a sly smile, she held her basket out to Valerie, who guessed what was inside before she saw. Or maybe she smelled them, their mother's favorite sweet cakes. Such a good idea, Valerie stood, brushing off the dirt off the back of her tunic. Lucy, pleased with her foresight, put her arm around Valerie. Together they returned the little girls to their mothers who were working in the gardens. Women were tough in this village. And yet even the gruffest among them smiled at Lucy. Heading home, they passed a few pigs wheezing like sick old men, a baby goat that tried to tag along with some disdainful chickens, a serene cow munching on hay. They passed the long row of houses, standing on their stilts, as if ready to wander away, and arrived at the second one from the end. Hoisting themselves up from the ladder, the girls entered the landscape of their lives. The wood dresser was so warped that the drawers refused to close. The wooden rope bed had gave splinters. The washboard their father had made for their mother the winter before was worn down now. She needed another. The basket for her berries was low and flat. To ensure that none got crushed, in a shaft of light from the window, a few bits of feathers stuffing hung in the air, reminding Valerie of when they jumped on the mattress as girls, and, and entire clouds of feathers would float around them. There wasn't much to distinguish their home from the others. The furniture and the dagger horn was simple and functional. Everything served a purpose. A table had four legs, a flat top, and nothing more. Their mother was home, of course, working over the stove. She was lost in thought. Her hair was pulled. Into a loose spun at the top of her head. A few strands hanging free from the nape of her neck. Before the girls came in, Suzette had been thinking of her husband with all his faults and virtues. The fault that she blamed him for most of them all. The fault was not forgivable. What was that? He was unimaginative. She was thinking of a recent day, feeling dreamy, feeling like giving him a chance, she'd asked hopefully. What is outside the walls, do you think? He chewed his food, swallowed, even tossed back some ale. He looked like he was thinking. A whole lot more of the same, I reckon. Susan had felt like falling to the ground. People left her alone. Suzette felt cut off from things, like a marionette whose strings had been snipped. 
Stirring the stew, she realized she was caught in a whirlpool. The more she struggled to get out, the more vehemently she was dragged down, down, down. Mother, Lucy came up behind her and gently tickled her back. Suzette returned to the world of daughters and uncooked stew. Are you girls thirsty? Suzette brightened, pouring up out two cups of water. She sweetened Lucy's with a nip of honey, but Valerie, she knew, had no use for it. You two have such a big day, she said, handing the appropriate glass to each girl. Suzette was grateful she had an excuse for staying home to cook the men's harvest meal. She went back to stirring the stew in a huge pot with handles on both sides. The pot had a low seated belly and always made Lucy feel strange because it was not quite a half spear. Spear. Lucy didn't like things that seemed incomplete. Valerie peered in. In the pot was a medley of brown oats and tan and gray seeds. Some green peas stood out garishly. Lucy chattered while Valerie set to work with Suzette, chopping the spindly strands off the carrots. Suzette was silent. Lucy's talk filled the dead air, but Valerie wondered whether something was wrong. Waiting for her mother's mood, she had learned as she had learned to do in the past, she added some vegetables to the pot, collards, garlic, onions, leeks, spinach, and parsley. What Valerie could not know was that Suzette had returned to thoughts of her husband. Césaire was a caring father and a supportive husband, but that was not all Suzette had promised herself. If expectations had been set lower, his failures might not have been so devastating. For what he did do, for the end that he had held up, Suzette was grateful. For those things she had felt had repaid him sufficiently by keeping a tidy household and by loving their children, she had to acknowledge that maybe in marriage, as any contractual obligation in matters of owing and being owed, there was no allowance for love. Feeling satisfied with this conclusion, Suzette turned to her girls to find Valerie gazing at her with those penetrating green eyes, almost as though she could hear her mother's thoughts. Suzette didn't know where Valerie's eyes had come from. Both hers and Cesare's were fawn brown. She cleared her throat. Good that you girls are helping out like this. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You'll need to be able to cook, Valerie, when you start to build your own home. Lucy already knows. Lucy was like Suzette. They foresaw, they planned. Valerie and Cesar were quick to think and quick to act. I'm 17, let's not rush it. Valerie sliced a potato through the skin was dull, velvety meat. She let the two halves fall open and bobble on the uneven table. She didn't think about the things her mother was always insisting on talking about. You are of marriageable age, Valerie. You're a young woman now. With this concession, all thoughts of any future responsibility dissipated from the sisters' minds. They saw their moment. So, Mother, we're leaving for the forest soon, Lucy began. Yes, of course. Your first time, Valerie, Suzette said. Looking down to conceal her pride, she had begun grating the cat cabbage. Some people... Some women are staying on afterward, Valerie added. For the little campfire thing, Lucy continued. Mm-hmm, Susan allowed, her mind beginning to wander. Prudence's mother is taking some of the other girls to the camp out, said Valerie. And we wanted to know if we could go, Lucy finished. With Prudence's mother? Suzette processed the one piece of concrete information she'd been given. Yes, said Valerie. She seemed to accept this explanation. The other mother has already said yes. Yes, Valerie said again. All right, I guess that will be okay, she said absentmindedly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was only then, seeing the extent of their gratitude, that Suzette realized she consented to something maybe she shouldn't have. I can't believe she said yes, Valerie exclaimed. That was so good. How you kept saying yes so she didn't have time to think about it. The girls ampled down the ruddy road to the town square, and you were so good tickling her back.
That was good, right? I know she likes it, Lucy smiled in satisfaction. Lucy, don't tell me you brought your whole wardrobe. Their friend Roxanne peered at them from around the corner, her pale brown brow knit into lines of concern. Two more girls came into view behind her, Prudence and Rose. Lucy was cradling her pack in her arms, and Valerie, belated, realized it, that it was bulging. You're going to have to carry it around all day, Valerie said. Prudence scowled, knowing Lucy got overambitious sometimes. We're not going to carry it for you if you get tired. Extra blank blankets, Lucy smiled. She got cold easily. Planning on having company, Rose asked. One eyebrow arched, Valerie thought. Their three friends looked like a trio of mythical goddesses. Roxanne's hair was rust-colored and smooth. It was so fine as look it looked as though all of it could fit into one stalk of straw. Her freckles were faint, like spots on a butterfly's wings. Between all of her corsets and blouses and shawls, it was obvious to Valerie that she was shy about her body. Rose, on the other hand, kept the ties of her blouse loose. She didn't rush to fix it if it fell a little too low. She was pretty, with a heart-shaped mouth and a sharp face. She sucked in her cheeks to make it more so. Her hair was so dark that the black it was black or brown or blue, depending on the light. If you put her in a finer top, Rose could almost pass for a lady, at least until she opened her mouth. Prudence was a melancholic beauty with light brown hair and a calculating manner. She was often too quick with a sharp word, but she usually apologized. She was tall and somewhat imperious. All five girls headed out through the villages, gates opened up and the hill towards the field, falling in with the parade of men who were excited too. The town itself felt wide awake, the anticipation of floating in the air like the smell of a strong, unexpected spice. Roxanne's brother, Claude, kept up with them, stumbling as he tried to kick a stone forward with each step. Hi, Claude's eyes were quick and gray. He was a bit younger than the girls, a village outcast who always been a little different. Claude wore a single suede glove without explanation, and he was always shuffling a deck of homemade cards that he carried with him at all times. The pockets were forever pulled out of his patchwork pants and mash up of all the pieces of burlap and hide his mother had been lying around. He was teased about them, but he didn't mind. He was proud of the incredible work by his mother, who stayed up late into the night sewing, who worked hard enough at the tavern as it was. It was said that Claude had been dropped on by his head as an infant, and that was why he was so strange. Valerie thought the notion was ridiculous. He was a beautiful soul. The trouble was that instead of rushing to get his own words as everyone else did, he really listened. And that made people think he was slow, but he was kind and good and a lover of animals and people. He never washed his socks, and so and no one washed them for him either. Both he and Roxanne were freckled, but Claude more so, even on his lips. Everyone called Roxanne and Claude redheads, but Valerie never knew why. She thought it must have been for the lack of imagination. She would call them six o'clock in the evening sunset heads, bottom of the lake of trenchels of algae heads. Valerie grew up feeling envious of those heads of hair because she felt like they were something special, a mark from God. Claude and Valerie listened to the other girls, chattered about the boys from the neighboring villages who would be coming to help with the harvest. Claude lost interest and ambled back towards the center of town. Something changed in the air as though the girls had passed a temporary outdoor blacksmith shop that had been set up to the path of the harvest. A sense of awareness set in, a quickening of breath, a loss of focus. 
Valerie narrowed her eyes in disappointment at her friends. They were too smart for this, losing it over a boy, Henry Lazar. He was lanky and dashing, with cropped hair and a relaxed smile. The girls saw him at work outside with his equally handsome father, Adrian, repairing axles for the harvest wagon. The way some people love to cook or to work in the garden, Henry loved the intricacies of locks, the process of planning, the designing, the making. He had shown he a few he had made to Valerie once, square and round, one shaped unwittingly like the head of a cat, another like an upturned house drawn by a child, or a family crest, some black, some gold, some gold underneath blackened tarnish. Valerie waved easily as her friends went mute, smiled shyly at their feet. They shuttled past. Only Lucy, Lucy curtsied politely. Henry shook his head, grinning. Rose hung back at the last moment to make very sure her eyes met Henry's and held his gaze long enough to make him feel uncomfortable. Other than that, the girls pretended that Henry hadn't affected them at all and self-consciously continued with their conversation. Close as they were, they felt that admitting their attraction would make themselves vulnerable. Besides this way, each girl got to feel as if they were keeping Henry to herself. Valerie couldn't help wondering why her own reaction was so different from theirs. True, he was good-looking, charming, tall, and kind, but it did not leave her feeling girly and giddy. I hope you guys hadn't hadn't forgotten who's coming today, Valerie teased them. Some of them have to be handsome, Lucy jumped in, by rules of ratios. The girls jumped up at one another and reached for each other's hands, jumping up and down in unison. They would be free for the night, and in Daggerhorn, a night of freedom meant everything. The Little Red Riding Hood. Thank you for watching. See Siren ASMR. I am Janine. Sweet dreams. Rose, on the other hand, kept the ties of her blouse loose, and she didn't rush to fix it if it fell a little too low. She was pretty, with a heart-shaped mouth and a sharp face. She sucked in her cheeks to make it more so, too. Her hair was so dark that it was a black or brown or blue, depending on the light. If you put, a fi if you put her in a finer top, Rose could almost pass for a lady, at least until she opened her mouth. Prudence was a melancholic beauty with light brown hair and a calculating manner. She was often too quick with a sharp word, but she usually apologized. She was tall and somewhat imperious.